What's up everybody, Tori McElhaney here checking in from the 2023 NFL Combine. Scott Bear and I have been here all week in Indianapolis and we've had a lot of conversations with national media about where they think your Atlanta Falcons are in 2023 and what this draft could hold for them. Now, as a special edition of the Falcons Final Whistle podcast, we wanted to bring you those conversations so that you could hear from them what they think the national perspective of your team is. So let's get into it. It's Scott Bayer, AtlantaFalcons.com, digital managing editor here with Ben Solak from The Ringer. Ben, it's going to be a fascinating offseason for the yeah. Atlanta Falcons. They have more than $66 million in cap space. They have a top 10 draft pick. They have a lot of needs, too. Yeah. What do you expect from this franchise over the course of the next weeks and months? I'm interested to see what happens with you know, key free agent. I think Caleb McGarry is a big conversation for them. Because if you keep McGarry in the building, offensively, you feel really good about what you got. The question mark is quarterback, what, how much you want to trust Desmond Ritter, what sort of leash you want to give him relative to the quarterbacks you might be able to get early. I like Ritter. I've liked Ritter for a long time. I think what you saw over the, that last quarter of the season makes you feel like he's getting it. He's coming up to NFL speed. You can see it starting to click. And I would imagine they feel good about trying to see what that looks like in the, in the first half of next year. And so if you can close the book on offense and say, we like Arthur Smith, we like some of our talent, we'll fill in some gaps here and there, you can turn to that defense where – there were some issues last season. And you obviously have a big change in defensive coordinator. You're going from Dean Pease and it's an odd front, and it's blitzing and it's crazy, to Ryan Nielsen, who I don't know if you saw those Saints defensive ends. They're a little bit bigger than the guys at Atlanta have. It's oh, yeah. Slightly different approach <laughs> to playing defense. I think you'll start to see a lot of resources get poured in there. And it's a pretty good defensive draft. It's a bit of a quiet free agency class overall, but there's good defensive options. I think you've got the chance to see a big turnover on that side of the ball and try to get that up to the speed of the offense. Yeah, and when you look at the state of the NFC South, right? I yeah. think I think Desmond Ritter might be the senior quarterback. What do you um, see from the entire uh, four teams in yeah. that spot? It seems like it could be wide open. I mean, I remember the the, the graphic in the middle of the season. The Falcons were like five and four. Everybody else was like five and five, four and five, and it was like that's where we're at right now, man. Everybody, it's 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 neck and neck. The Bucks are so talented but huge quarterback question mark, and then they have a ton of free agents. So you don't really know, are they gonna try to reload and let some of these guys walk and maybe take a year off? Or are they just gonna try to hit it with Kyle Trask, hit it with a veteran and go? So there's a question mark there. The Saints are, the Saints, I mean like, the Saints are gonna try to contend independent of whether or not that's a good idea. The Saints are gonna be putting guys on the field and, and attacking, and they've got good coaches, they're a smart team. And so the Saints are gonna be around that 500 mark. And then there's Carolina who came down nicely across the stretch at the end of last season. Frank Reich's putting together a great staff. like. A lot of the, uh, the the Carolina grassroots hype, I feel myself getting swept up into. You know what I'm saying? They, they, they're likable there in Carolina. I I was big on Atlanta to win the division last year. I was feeling great in like end of October, beginning of November. I was loving it. And we couldn't get the, uh, the, the, the hay in the barn, as it were. I'll like Atlanta again this year, though. Like Arthur Smith, I think, is the best offensive mind that you've got in the division. And this is a, a offensive football-driven league. And I think that Arthur Smith's on the cutting edge of that. And so that, that to me, is the, that's the edge. That's the advantage. It's filling in the gaps. It, it's handling the free agency stuff. It's handling the defense, bringing that up to speed. But with what Smith does offensively, Atlanta's in a, a bit of a leading point as of right now. A lot can change in the NFC South. It, it's so interesting, though, because if you look at his offense in 2021, it was Matt Ryan-centric, yep. right? And they were throwing the ball downfield. And then in 2022, it was ground and pound and run 10 times and score. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that kind of model? He really seems to mold his scheme to the players that he has. Mm -hmm. But do you think that we're going to keep seeing that that rushing foundation from Arthur Smith as we move forward? Yeah, because defenses are going to stay light and, and, and they have light personnel. They're going to have an extra defensive back on the field. They're going to have lighter pass rushers. And Arthur Smith is a what don't you like coach, right? He looks at a defense over the course of a week. He looks at defense over the course of the year and he says, all right, what do you not like today? Who are you trying to hide from me? What area of the field are you trying to keep me from? I'm going to find my way there, right? And that's when you start to see like, hey, I got an ex-Iowa linebacker playing fullback where I can just ram into a gap and he's bigger than your middle linebacker is. And we're going to, you know, I've got a big back in Cordell Patterson, a real big back in Tyler Algier, who was great for them down the stretch. Like I have size and physicality. I can do this. I can, I can beat you on the ground. And then it's Marcus Mariota, all 220 pounds of him on a boot, throwing 10 yards, like average of 11 at ADOT, right? Like led the league in depth of target. That sort of an approach works for the personnel you got. So, okay, now it's Desmond Ritter. And then, okay, maybe, you know, Kyle Pitts starts to be used a little bit a different way. Maybe they draft a receiver early, and now I've got a different guy. And you'll see stuff change. But fundamentally, like Arthur Smith, this was, goes back to his Tennessee days, he knows how to be bigger than the other guy. And if you're going to let him have that, I mean, he's going to hold the ball for 40 minutes, and he's going to make it physically hurt. And that's the – 
development in the NFL is a pendulum, right? We saw the last 10 years, everything swings towards passing. It swings to being lighter. And Arthur Smith's now starting to anticipate the swing back, where, okay, if I can put heavy personnel on the field and win, I'm going to do that, and it'll be to my advantage. Yeah, and when you look at this defensive front, which does need some help, and yeah. you look at what the Saints employ, mm -hmm. they got defensive ends who are like 285. Yeah. That, that it's, it's a different breed. So would you anticipate some personnel changes up front, you know, or, or will it continue to be that multiple front hybrid model and trying to uh, manipulate personnel on the defensive side of the football? To a degree, I think you're going to see some personnel changes. The Saints are trying to solve a problem with their defensive fronts. Fun, oh, Dennis Allen has been the DC there for a long time now as the head coach, wants to play with two safeties deep. Everybody wants to play with two safeties deep now, right? So, okay, if you're going to take a guy out of the box and play him deep, now you have a, a box count problem. You have one less dude. How are you going to solve the problem? The Vic Fangio defense, they, you know, play these odd fronts and they add guys. Dean Pease, when you go too high, would blitz, right? Add guys from depth. The Saints solution was, let's just have four enormous dudes up front, right? And it worked for them great for a while. They'd run into some rushing quarterbacks and have some trouble, right? Because those, you know, Cam Jordan against Jalen Hurts and Lamar Jackson in space, it's not what you like. So your solutions are, they, 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 they got problems that they solve, and then they also have weak points. And so what you're hoping with Ryan Nielsen, a guy who's, you know, got college background, we're hoping with Arthur Smith, the guy who's just a good football mind in general, is, okay, we want to play with two deep safeties. That's the way the league is going. But that's going to present problems, box count problems, run defense problems. We need to have different solutions. So there's solutions that involve, let's go get a 280-pound, let's go get Tano Capasignol, let's get a big defensive end, right? But there's also solutions that's like, how can we use D'Angelo Malone creatively? You know what I'm saying? Like, how can we use some athletes in space a little bit better? There's there's a lot of a lot of ways to skin a cat. That's what they used to say where I grew up in Pennsylvania. A lot of different ways to skin a cat. And so they're going to come up with, hopefully, dynamic solutions that's not just relying on one thing to solve the problems you have on the defensive side of the ball. There's no way that I can let you out of here without one no. more question. They have the number eight overall pick. Yeah. There's lots of options. We could see quarterback chaos at the top that mm -hmm. pushes edge rushers. Maybe the first cornerback taken still there at eight. What do you anticipate being available to the Falcons around that number eight cluster? Absolutely. I think you're going to see the peak of the cornerback class, which is really strong this year, be right there at that eight pick. And that's where I'm really interested in with the Falcons right now because A.J. Terrell is so good. But you don't want to be in a position where teams can go, okay, we don't want to throw at that guy. We're going to throw at the guy over there. Yeah, we're going to throw the guy over there. Right. And when you saw the, the Saints defense be successful over the last few years, like Marshawn Lattimore, incredible, obviously. But they had a Paulson and a Debo that they could cycle in who was good for them on the outside. A Ken Crawley who was good for them. Uh, they had Alante Taylor, right? They did a great job of filling that corner two spot and that lets you play man coverage, which is the golden goose in the NFL. If you play man coverage, you're good. So I think you're going to see that that top of the corner position, Joey Porter Jr., Penn State, Devon Witherspoon, Illinois, Christian Gonzalez, Oregon. You'll see those guys available. You're going to see the second tier of edge rushers. We talked a lot about getting those big defensive ends. Lucas Van Ness out of Iowa is a guy who's got that size. You're going to start to see those guys come into play. Other than that, yeah, you're going to get like the edge of the quarterback class as well. And you have to have an honest conversation about that. How much do you like some of these guys who can develop, who's a project, who do you want to get into the building? Um, but that the corner position specifically, Atlanta is really well suited for that right now. So that's where my mind goes first. Fascinating conversation heading into a fascinating offseason. Ben Solak from The Ringer, thanks for stopping by. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. We're here catching up with NBC Sports NFL analyst Chris Sims to get his thoughts on the Falcons in 2023. So, we're here at the Combine. If you're the Falcons, if you're Terry Fano, if you're Arthur Smith, what are you looking at as you are kind of going into this week? Well, there's a few things I think you could, you know, certainly look at. You know, the defensive side of the ball, pass rusher, certainly one area you look at where the Falcons can improve. The quarterback situation, I think, is maybe still on the radar, right? I mean, where you guys are picking, this group looks pretty good as far as that position is concerned. I know Desmond Ritter did some good things too, but I would think, you know, some evaluations are going to be done there in that department as far as what they want to do, rookie, maybe a veteran, somebody. They're going to add somebody to the mix, right? Um, so I think those are two that probably – you know, jump off the top of my head. I always think with Arthur Smith, you know, hey, offensive lineman at some point, uh, but that's they got some damn good offensive linemen too. But I, I guess that, you know, pass rusher, quarterback, that's probably the two I think about it the most here. This is kind of a very different offseason than the, these two guys, Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot, have had over the last two years. Right. I mean, what can you kind of say about the work that they did over those two years to get to the point where you have $66.676 million in cap space? I like what they have done. First off, you know, Terry has built the team with what I, what I would say, you know, not to, like a lot of good meat and potatoes guys, right? And, 
you know, maybe now there's some sizzle that's got to be added to it with these all this money, right? Because that's how you get the, you know, want the really expensive steak that sizzle is you got to pay some money for it, right? So I, I would think that's the thing they look at. And then Arthur Smith, I'm a huge Arthur Smith fan. I just, you know, I'm a huge Mike Vrabel fan. I know what that coaching culture is like. I know Arthur Smith has brought that there as well. It's tough. It's hard nosed. It's detailed. Every game I watch, I go, this is the right game plan for them against this team. This is what they should do. You know, so uh, I, I like their cohesion and mix here. And, you know, hey, offensive linemen, there is some size on the defensive front, right? You got an A.J. Terrell at the corner, the Drake London, the tight end, all of that. Now I think it's time for, yeah, some difference makers, some guys that, hey, it doesn't always have to be the most perfect drive. This guy can catch a slant and run for 60 yards or, you know, get a big sack to close out a close football game there. We come out on top. I, I feel like that's where we're, we're at with Atlanta right now. I mean, let's just talk about quarterbacks yeah, for, I for a second. I, I mean, know. with Desmond Ritter, I mean, only a four game sample size. But what did when you're watching what yeah. he did in that four games, what are you kind of taking from that? Right. Yeah, I mean, he does a lot of good things. I love, first off, the Desmond Ritter, the person, the leader, the worker. I, you know, I've heard so many good things about him. I've gotten to be around him a little and he really popped to me in that way. Right. He plays with size. You know, his. Arm is not a big time arm, but he can make all the throws, right? And we saw the athletic ability pop, you know, from time to time as well. So those are the things I like, you know. Now, are they sold? Am I sold that he's definitely the guy for the future? No, I'm not. Like you said, it's four games. It's early. And there's some things I question about his game. Uh, and so that's where I go. Like, I think all doors are open for Atlanta in that department. I mean, I don't know. I'm crazy. And, hey, draft. You know, hey, we know there's going to be some free agent quarterbacks out there. I still, I don't. Am I crazy to think Lamar Jackson in Atlanta makes sense? I continue to throw that out there. So, you know, no disrespect to Desmond Ritter, got great respect for him, but yeah, I don't think he's nailed down that spot quite yet. So, what is it going to take for I guess the Falcons to take the next step in yeah. in, in where Terry and Arthur want to take? Them? I think it's kind of what we talked about. You know, it's 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 an O line that we know can open up some holes and just impose their physical will on you, right? Drake London looks like he's going in the right direction. All that, you know, I, I think it's just kind of rounding out the roster now. Let's get another receiver along with Drake London, right? Uh, let's maybe add another game breaking type you know Algier is great between the tackles all that let's get a speed guy you know when we throw screens or third down he's a real viable option in the pass game right and then I think when you get into that pass rusher maybe big time middle linebacker conversation those are kind of the things I guess I look at with Atlanta but you're not far off they've exceeded my expectations the last two years as far as wins or losses and I think that's because the job you know Terry has done with value value picks, value free agents to get that meat and potatoes. And then Arthur's, you know, ability to coach the team is, is damn good. Last question yeah. and then I'll let you get on. Yeah, but with Arthur and kind of establishing an identity, even kind of when we're talking about the meat and potatoes, guys rotating in and out. I mean, when you look at the Atlanta Falcons offense, do you see an identity forming and something that's there? Definitely. Yeah, I, I, I get, it's close. It really is. I mean, first off, the identity is just, hey, we're going to line up and whoop your ass. I mean, that, that's the identity. It's just like, hey, we're going to run it. You know we're going to run it, and we're still going to get five yards up the middle. That's There's something to say about that. There is. They're well coached up front. They got the type of guys that make sense. And then he makes them tougher, I feel like, with you know his Mike Vrabel-ish type culture, right? You know, you get around Arthur, he's tough. There's no nonsense. He never cracks a smile. I'm always like, I think he hates me, but maybe he likes me. I'm not sure. Uh, but but that's a good coach, right? I think my dad would probably say Bill Parcells was like that. I don't know if he hated me or liked me on a, on a certain day. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, what was the original question? I actually... The, the identity. Yeah, I think there is an identity there. I think the NFL knows their identity. I think the public, because they are not in enough of a national stage games yet, haven't realized it yet, but I'm guessing this is going to be the year that, you know, people kind of realize what they got going on down there. Senior NFL reporter for Sports Illustrated and author of the MMQB and a thousand other titles, Albert Breer is here with me to talk a little Falcons football. Yep. Now the Falcons have a lot of cap space. Mm -hmm. They have a top 10 draft pick. What is your outlook for what can be accomplished over, over the course of what's going to be a very important off season for this organization. Yeah, I mean, I think what's really interesting is they've got a good group of young core players now. And, you know, you look at the Chris Lidstrom's and the Kyle Pitts and Drake London's and the AJ Terrell's, uh, Murphy Grant, like they, 
I, I feel like they feel like now they've got a good core of players where now they can sort of go into go into the draft, go into free agency with their options open, just looking to add more good players. And, um, you know, look, I think last year was tough for them logistically for a lot of different reasons, but they had to do it. And I think it's, you know, similar, and I'm sure you guys have used this comparison a million times, but it's like what um, what Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott did their second year in Buffalo where they cleared the decks in that one year, and then they were aggressive building around Josh Allen going into 2020. Um, I think you're going to see a similar approach this year where they're going to be – maybe not targeting specific positions as much as just looking to bring in good players, both in free agency and the draft and being aggressive in doing it. Yeah, they, they really had to make some tough choices and some sacrifices to to create this financial flexibility. Yep. What was the national perception of how they went about their business? And, and they, I mean, Arthur Smith and, and, and of course, the uh, Falcons GM. Yeah, well, I'll start with Arthur. And I, you know, I think one thing you noticed about Arthur's teams the last two years is there's a very well-defined uh, identity like mm -hmm. they're tough they're creative in the run game um, and they play hard they may not be winning all the time yet but they play really really hard um, and so the national perception is that it's like a, a really well coached team and that they're being patient and building um, and that Terry Fontenot is taking a very methodical approach in the way he's doing it and um, you know look like you know we saw Chicago do it last year too now they did it in year one with that Eber Foose and Ryan Poles um, but that's what happens a lot of times in these situations where, you know, on the back end, whether again, Rex Ryan in Buffalo or, um, you know, Dan Quinn in Atlanta or, um, you know, or, or Matt Nagy in Chicago, the end, a lot of times with, you know, a, a coach or a general manager who's hanging on cap issues arise sure. because you see the team trying to hold on and trying to make it work with the core players that maybe they won with earlier. And, you know, like I, I think it's interesting when you see the kind of cleanup crew come in in these places yeah. and they have to do that one year where they're where, where they're really taking on the dead money and, and clearing the decks. And so, you know, I, I think it wasn't a matter of if it was a matter of when they did it. And so, you know, obviously the Falcons hung on to Matt um, for that extra year and tried to establish something in year one, which, again, is just what Buffalo did. Um, and then in year two was their clear the decks year. But, you know, I, I think it was going to have to happen sooner or later. As you look at this young foundation that the Falcons have, and you also look at what they need, how would you prioritize th their offseason needs and where or if quarterback fits into that list? Yeah, I think quarterback's going to be interesting because I think that they'll pull multiple multiple lever levers mm -hmm. there. I also think, like, I mean, I don't think Desmond Ritter is, like, guaranteed to be the starter, but I think he's going to get an opportunity. Yeah. You know, it's so, 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 sort of similar to Kyle Trask in Tampa where, you know, they're going to look around at all of their options. I think the Falcons will look around at all of their options and probably sign a free agent and probably draft another one. Um, you know, but they're going to give De – I think Dez is going to have a legitimate shot. And there's a lot of things to like about Dez, both tangibly and intangibly. Um, and I'm sure you know, Scott, who he is as a guy. So I, I think quarterback's near the top of the priority list. Now, does that mean they're going to take a massive swing? Maybe not. But I think they're going to do multiple things at the position. Um, you know, and then outside of that, again, like I think that they're just sort of in this position where they can they can sort of add where they need to add because they've got good pieces in a bunch of different position groups to build around without, I think, a crying need anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at like where they're picking, for example, they're picking eighth, I think. Right. Eight. So they're picking eighth overall. Well, you know, if you look at the makeup of the draft class, that puts them right in front of the cliff where there's really supposed to be a drop off around the 11th or 12th pick. And the players who are above that cliff are more or less defensive pressure players. Right. So, like, could you be looking at, like, the Iowa pass rusher? Could you be looking at one of the Clemson kids, whether it's Brzee or, um, or Murphy? Um, you're probably not going to get Jalen Carter or Will Anderson. Right. But, like, you've got a chance to get a really good defensive player up there. So, I think that's going to sort of – that sort of illustrates the way I think they're going to approach this, where it's – they don't I, – I think they go both into free agency and the draft without a feeling that they need to press a certain need – and that allows them to just go get good players. And I have one more question for you. There is a new defensive coordinator in town, Ryan Nielsen, yep. comes from the Saints, mm -hmm. is well known for developing a solid pass rush. What What is your take on that move and what do you think he can bring to this Falcons defense? Ryan's incredibly well-respected and was one of the more well-respected people in the, in the Saints building. Um, and obviously Terry knows him. And I, I think, you know, like having the background 
with him helps, you know, and I, and I think when you look at the physical edge that Arthur's brought to the offense, I think the idea is Ryan will bring that to the defense and he's got a lot of head coach qualities. And I think you guys will find that out about him when you get around him a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I mean like creative because Sean Payton demanded that and building his staffs in New Orleans. So I think you're going to see a, a defensive coordinator who's creative and a defensive coordinator who's going to prioritize toughness, which sounds a lot like what the Falcons have been doing the last couple of years on offense. Albert Breer, thank you so much for the time and for previewing what is going to be a fascinating offseason for the Falcons. Thanks, Scott. I'm here with Robert Mays, the host of The Athletic Football Show, to talk a little Falcons football. Kind of just looking at where the Falcons are right now in comparison to kind of what they've had the last couple of years, let's just talk salary cap. I mean, what do you see when you're looking at the opportunity that the Falcons have going into this offseason? It's a chance to build. I think that over the last two years, you're just trying to get out from under the financial boulder that the last regime created for you. And you understand how you get there, right? You have Matt Ryan, you have Julio Jones, you have ownership that's willing to spend to the cap every single year. I mean, Thomas Dimitrov did what he did to squeeze everything you could out of those rosters, but eventually the bill comes due. And Terry Fondo had to clean up that over the last couple of years. And now you get a chance to build the team that you envision. They've been able to do it slowly through the draft and the patience that they've shown there. But now if you want to go out and get a top of market free agent at safety, at corner, at some of those positions of need, that's on the table now. So it just creates a little bit of a different sense of urgency. I like what they did with the two extensions that they handed out. So they, Jake Matthews created Jared, they retained both of those guys because you want to have these kind of beacons in your locker room, even when you're in sort of a rebuild, tear down mode. And I think on offense and defense, they had those guys. Like This is what we want the Falcons to be. So having those two guys under contract while also trying to skimp and save other places and giving yourself flexibility to move on from Marcus when it was time. They've just done a good job of never cutting off pathways to different versions of the team and different, different team building options. So that's how you end up with $70 million in cap space and the eighth overall pick. And to choose your own adventure, sort of off season for them. And they could go any direction, positionally, financially. And that's all you can ask for as a general manager. I'm not painting myself into any corners. We can go wherever we want to with a roster that has a ton of needs all over the place. So they're in a really good spot. But like he said yesterday at the podium, when you have $70 million in cap space, that means you have a lot of work to do. And the Falcons have a lot of work to do. CBS color commentary guy on Sundays, NFL Network analyst Charles Davis. And we're here to talk a little Falcons and they could be a very interesting team over the course of this offseason. They have plenty of cap space. They have a top 10 pick. What are you expecting out of this franchise over the next couple of weeks and months? I'm expecting all of us to enjoy watching what Terry Fontenot and the front office are gonna do mm -hmm. because all the things you just lined up, yeah. perfect, right? Then you take into account the division right now Tampa Bay won the division, but they don't scare anyone. And when you have a division that's as wide open as you have right now, plus it certainly looks like you found your quarterback. And, and you know, a lot of times we analyze divisions by quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. In the NFC South right now, the ranking quarterback is one Desmond Ritter. Which is just wild to me. It is absolutely wild for all of us yeah. because just a couple seasons ago, we were talking about Cam Newton was at Carolina, <laughs> Tom Brady was in Tampa Bay. So this is what we're looking at right now. Desmond Ritter looks to be the guy. That's who they'll build around. I like how they've, they've played under Arthur Smith because they look like a 3-4 win team, yet yeah, every game they're in, they're battling, they're still there. And down the stretch, there was still an opportunity. Didn't quite get there, but I certainly love what they're doing. I really like the fact that Ritter already has a number one receiver in London. Mm -hmm. And now you've got to find yourself a runner, pretty, a pretty good runner last year in Tyler Algier. Yeah, and my favorite Desmond stat was that he was 44 and six in college. Yeah. The guy's just a gamer. What did you learn about him studying his tape, entering you know the the uh, professional leagues, and what do you think he did during his uh, you know his first four NFL starts? Scott, I think you brought up the biggest one right there. 44 and six in college. Now, look, it's not like a professional pitcher in terms of record, right. but there is an element of how did he drive a football team and help elevate a program to a level where they were playing in a college football playoff against Alabama. There's something to that, right? right? There's something to him getting better each and every year in consistency in throwing the football, the ability to run the football and have consistency there and toughness, which he get, helped give that ball club because Cincinnati built themselves on being a, a tough group, that group of Bearcats. Take that to what we saw this year in San Francisco with Brock Purdy. 
who had about 46, 48 college starts, who elevated a program at Iowa State that was never supposed to be that great to where they were playing for a Big 12 championship, where they were a preseason top 10 the next year. And he goes to a ready-made team, and I say ready-made, meaning all the elements in front, really good offensive line, excellent runners, trade for McCaffrey to make them even better, wide receivers, Debo Samuel, you name it. Plus, Kyle Shanahan does a great job running offense. He fit in perfectly. Desmond Ritter would have been a perfect candidate to have been that same Brock Purdy type, but his team wasn't ready for him yet. They're going to come along with him. So tell Falcons fans what they can expect around that number eight overall pick. There's definitely some intriguing talents, pass rushers, cornerbacks. Falcons need a lot of help, especially on defense. What can they expect within that draft cluster around that number eight spot? The quarterbacks always drive a draft, good, bad, or indifferent. This year is not superstar power like we've had in the past, but plenty of really, really good ones. Does Bryce Young come off the board first, right? Does CJ Stroud come off the board first? How deep do we go with Will Levis, right, right with Kentucky? So once all that kind of gets taken care of and, does, and do people come up to get the guy that they absolutely want, that could drive things for Atlanta as well. Because then if it's more quarterbacks and defenders, does Jalen Carter go from maybe being the top player in the draft to sliding to a point where Atlanta may have a shot? Does Will Anderson from Alabama, who may be the top player in the draft, does he slide, quote unquote, to where Atlanta has an opportunity? Those sort of questions will play themselves out, but the quarterbacks will drive it. No ifs, ands, and buts. I don't think we have the receivers that come all the way up this year. It's not the same. We'll have a lot of good ones, but not quite the same. I really think it's going to be the quarterbacks, and then we're going to have the, the elite defenders. They'll be the ones in the top cluster. Yeah, the Falcons have made no secret that they want to get better rushing the passer and they want to get more explosive on offense. If we're focusing on the defensive side of the ball, talk about the depth of this edge rusher and, and, and maybe defensive tackle class it, that everybody focuses on number eight. Mm -hmm. But can you get some sneaky good players <laughs> down the line at uh, those two spots? You certainly can. And, and, and what's going to be interesting is I think you can get them all the way through. Really? And, and, and what people are going to look at, obviously, the higher the draft pick, the more the expectations, the lower the draft pick. Oh, are we sure about this guy? I was at the Senior Bowl, and I'm watching guys playing and saying, they may not be first-round guys, they may not be second-day guys, but these guys can play. I look up and see this kid, uh, Gerard Clark, from Coastal Carolina, this behemoth of a, of a, of a run, you know, space eater, who can flat-out play, get upfield a little bit. He might be a third-day guy, but he might be a guy you could plug in right away. I'm looking at Will McDonald, the outside linebacker defensive end from Iowa State. Size might be an issue because he's not the thickest guy, but if you have a plan for him and make him a designated pass rusher early as he grows into his body, this guy knows how to go chase quarterbacks. I think he has the Big 12 record for quarterback sacks in a career. Again, mm -hmm. I don't think he's a first-day guy. He's probably a second, third-round guy. But again, you better have a plan because I don't think he's a full-line full line starter right out of the gate. And my equation for him is Alden Smith coming out of Missouri. That's Vic a Fangio. pretty nice equation, yeah. But Vic Fangio had a plan in San Francisco. Oh, we're not going to overload Alden early. So he had 15 and a half sacks while they didn't overload him. <laughs> I'm not saying that's what Will McDonald's going to do, but he has great potential coming off the edge. And I just have one last question for you, Charles, and thank you so much for taking sure. the uh, time with us. You look at the state of this NFC South, and you'd already mentioned it. There are a lot of veteran quarterbacks who have wide left. Wide open. It's wide open. And we see time and time again that the NFL is built on parity. You see worst to first, thirds to, to first, Every and the year. Falcons have all these assets. Now, do they have to get it right? Sure. sure. But is there the opportunity, do you think, for Arthur Smith and, and Terry to upgrade the, this roster and maybe get right into the playoff chase here? The opportunity is definitely there, and here's why I say it. Not just roster, not just upgrading, not just what I saw them do over these first two years. Yeah. This is what you're seeing, what you're seeing on Sundays where when you have to deal with the Falcons, where people look at it normally, well, it should be okay. And then all of a sudden it's tough. You take an L <laughs> that you didn't expect to take. Yeah. You, you escape by this, by the skin of your teeth. They competed each and every week. They got better each and every week with talent that a lot of people say, yeah, not so great. Mm -hmm. They've got more than a chance, especially in this division. Could it true? It truly is wide open. You can't sit here and say, "I know Tampa won it last year." Are they truly the favorites, or is everyone a favorite this year? Right. Who's Good. going to reach out and grasp it and take it? Because the league is built to you're built to be eight and eight. Mm -hmm. Well, nowadays it's nine and eight, I guess. <laughs> right. Which way are you going to go from nine and eight? Yeah. Plus or minus? They have a chance to elevate.
It's going to be fascinating to see all of these developments around the Atlanta Falcons. Charles Davis, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about it. Thanks for spending time with me. Well, there you have it, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this very special edition of the Falcons Final Whistle podcast. You can catch us on Spotify, YouTube, all the things, iTunes even. Go and give us a five-star review, and we'll be back throughout the remainder of the 2023 NFL offseason.